Hey everybody, today we're going to look at getting started in film photography. So maybe somebody has handed down a camera to you, or maybe you saw one in a thrift shop, an old film camera such as one of these, like a 35mm single lens reflex camera, or maybe even an older rangefinder type camera like this Retina 2A from the 1950s. Both are great little cameras that take fine 35mm film photos. Uh, so a lot of it th this is going to be about uh, how to load the film, how to expose for the film, and we'll also look at getting the film back out of the camera so that you can turn it in for it to be processed. So let's dive in. So the first thing we want to look at is how to load the film. We th Almost all of these cameras have a little spindle at the top that you're going to be looking to take, and you're going to be lifting that spindle up in order to unlock the back door. And the back door pops open. You can see there's the, the curtain. On one side, on the left-hand side, is where you're going to insert the film cartridge. And then you're going to pull the little tail over, and you're going to find on the spindle on the other side the little slit. And you insert the tail of the film into that little slit, and you usually have to fire off a shot on the camera and get that spindle to wind around and catch it. Also be sure like along that spindle there's a little geared mechanism and you want to make sure on that geared mechanism to just kind of make sure that those little tines are going up into the little areas of the film that allow for that. Um, I usually just kind of press down and make sure that they're catching there and crack off another shot, watch the film spin around. That's a good time there to close the door and depress the spindle at the top and then you're going to look at the top where there is that little window. And you're going to press the shutter and you're going to wind the camera until you get it to sync up with frame number one. And that's when you're ready to shoot. Now on the other camera, it's a little bit different. It's got a little latch on the side and that's where uh, I would un unlatch it, open it up. And then a lot of the rest is kind of the same. I'm looking to find the little tail and pop it into that slit on the other side, making sure that the little tines of that gear go into those little gear holes. And then I'm going to fire off the camera, camera a couple times and wind it to make sure that it catches. Then I close the door. Now a real important little tip here is that when you are winding it up to advance to that one, you want to watch the spindle on the left. And if the spindle does not spin, then that means that your film is not catching and it's probably come loose and you probably want to open the door and make sure that it's for sure catching on that other side. The spindle should spin if the film is advancing. On this other camera, the little retina, it's a little different in that I actually have to advance this little dial at the top over to the little diamond shape and at that point then I fire off a couple of shots and it lines me up with a 36 shot roll. So depending upon what camera you're using, um, a lot of them operate pretty similarly to that. Once you have your film loaded up, you're ready to go. So let's talk about metering. There are reflective meters that are found inside of these cameras. They're usually indicated in a number of different ways. Some of them are an electronic readout um, that has a zero in the center. And sometimes it's like a little needle that floats along the, along the side. You can see that it's when it's overexposed, the needle falls up and then when it's underexposed, the needle will go below. And what we're really looking to do is to get that needle to land kind of in the center. Now, the thing to understand is that film has to be calibrated to something that's known. And what that zero is, is that film is calibrated to read a medium gray tone as a proper exposure when that is what's in the highlight area of the photograph, not so much in the shadow or the specular, but in the highlight portion of the image that the medium gray tone is what the film is calibrated to. So that's what it's looking for when it's wanting to zero out on something. This is why if you point your camera at a snowy scene and you zero that out, it's actually going to, reflective meter is actually going to want to change that exposure at that point to that medium gray tone. So you get an underexposed shot of a bright snowy scene because it's trying to change that white snow to medium gray. Incident meters, however, operate differently, and they measure the light that's falling onto the subject, onto this dome. And it gives you an accurate exposure based upon the ISO for that given situation. So you could take a meter like this and you could place it in the same lighting, in this case, like this key light hitting me, I would point this dome at that light and take a reading, and it's gonna give me the exposure based upon my ISO that would be appropriate. Now, it's, gonna, it's arbitrary, it's gonna give me whatever the exposure comes up as. I have to do the reciprocity to figure out if that is the f-stop that I'm intending. 
uh, if it gives me f5.6, but I really want f11, I have to slow my shutter speed down in order to get that. Uh, and vice versa, if I want to open my aperture up more, I'll have to speed up my shutter speed. And I also have my ISO that I can play with at that point. But when it comes to film, your ISO is one thing that is not variable like it is on a digital camera. It's stuck at whatever film you put in. Today we're going to be looking at film of an ISO of 160. So this Sears 35mm camera, uh, is its focus is actually very simple. When you're looking through, it's just you can just see whether it's blurry or sharp. Um, and that's it. There's nothing special about it. There are some cameras that have like a little sort of circle that has a split thing and you line up the split, almost like rangefinder. Whereas my little retina camera here is more of a true rangefinder in that when I'm looking through the viewfinder here, I'm looking out this little window right here. I'm not actually looking through the lens like I am on a single lens reflex. These SLR cameras have a prism in them. And so when I'm looking through this viewfinder, it's reflecting on a mirror that's looking through the lens, giving me exactly what I'm intending to photograph. Whereas on a rangefinder camera, there's a little bit of a parallax. I'm, the image that I get in the end is going to be slightly off from what I see through the camera. It's really just kind of a guide to get things kind of lined up. And rangefinder is also interesting because it creates this sort of split image that you have to like match up in order to find your focus. So let's head out in the field and we can check this out. In this particular scene, the the scene itself, it's springtime here and it's a little drab, you know, the, the leaves haven't come out yet and everything's kind of got that kind of gray, woody sort of look. Uh, but all of that sort of falls within that medium gray, which is nice. So I could certainly meter into the woods there and get a pretty decent exposure. But in a situation like this, I'm out kind of in the late afternoon, but the sun is still pretty high and it's still pretty bright. And really we can use what's called sunny 16 in this situation, which says whatever your ISO is, match whatever the closest shutter speed to that is. So in our case, ISO 160. On my camera, I can go to 1 1 25th, okay? 1 1 25th at F16. In, that is in a bright, sunny, no clouds, full sun, sort of high noon, early afternoon type lighting, sunny F16. So that's kind of a baseline of exposure that we can work with. In this particular situation, it was exactly that. It was sunny, 16. I could put my camera on 1 125th at F16, knock off a shot, and get a good exposure. So this first shot that I took here is actually over by two-thirds of a stop because really what my scene is reading is 1 1 25th at f16 and 2 thirds, f16.7. But it's okay on negative film to overexpose it a little bit. And in this case, I've overexposed this one by 2 thirds of a stop. We can see the negative here, and we can see the final photo here as corrected by my lab. In the second one, I decided to open up to f8 just so that you could see this denser negative. Typically, I'll aim to overexpose negative film a bit to give me a denser negative. When it's underexposed, it's a thinner negative. You could see this, it resulted in much richer reds, but would be easily correctable by adding back a little cyan. An incident meter is going to give me a more accurate exposure, and I can certainly get an incident meter out and put it in the same general lighting as my overall scene that I'm looking to photograph and get a reading and go off of that. But if you don't have a light meter, but you have a reflective meter in your camera, you can use something like a gray card or something else that's about 18% gray to get a general exposure of this. In this case, I'm using my gray backpack because it's about 18% gray. I think they designed it that way. I put it in the same lighting as my overall scene. I meter off of that bag, and it essentially ends up being a cheat to become an incident meter at that point because the bag is medium gray. The camera is calibrated to read medium gray as a proper tone. It's relative to medium gray just like an incident meter is at that point. And if you're in a pinch, uh, green grass works pretty well as a, a gray tone, a medium tone that you're looking for. And in some cases, the palm of your hand might even be in a pinch if you need to get kind of close. Uh, negative film, also known as print film, has a pretty good latitude of a couple stops. And so you can over and underexpose it pretty well and the lab can correct. I would say more often than not, you're looking to overexpose this film rather than underexpose it. And we'll take a look at that. One thing that can help you out a lot when you're using a camera like this is to bring a notepad or use your smartphone and uh, take notes for every single shot you take what your settings were. And that can really help you when you get the film developed because the film itself does not have any of your exposure information written on it. 
but if you've written it down in some way, you can go back through and it's a nice learning tool. That's how I learned photography was to painstakingly write down every single exposure, examine my negatives, examine my print, um, and learn that way based upon like, oh, what's this f-stop versus this f-stop in depth of field? Um, was that shutter speed fast enough to capture action? Things like that. So in this next one, I thought I'd take the same shot with both cameras. So I metered this log just to see in the highlight area as well as a bit in this shadow, this kind of open shadow, open shade that I'm seeing, just to compare. I was getting about 1 250th at f5.6.5 5, on my meter. So I opened up to 4.5 to overexpose by one stop on the Sears 35mm camera. And then I pulled out the Retina rangefinder camera. The light had changed a little bit because the clouds were kind of moving around. I metered the scene and I got 250th at f5.6, about a half stop dimmer at this point. And so I opened up to f4 on my Retina and took this shot. The view, viewfinder is tighter crop on this camera and so my framing was a bit different. These 1950s cameras can be kind of funky to work with, but they're a lot of fun. So in this scene, I simply wanted two different shots at different depths of field. See, I have my model and my dog out on this log walking, and in this one, I shot it at 1 1 25th at f8. However, in this second one, I closed down my shutter speed by two stops and opened up my aperture two stops. So I'm at now 1 500th of a second at f4, resulting in a shot with less depth of field. We can even compare these two together, and you can see the background detail between f8 here on the left and f4 on the right. So then we went down to the beach, down to the where this sort of river was going by, and I wanted to get my model up on this big stump that was there and get some shots of her. So you can see I have her somewhat backlit, and in this shot, the whole front of her is in shadow. And so when I meter the highlight, the highlight on the face was reading 250th at f8. So I opened up by one stop to f5.6, but the shadow side of her face is really closer to f4. So you can see in this negative how clear her shirt and her hair and even the hillside behind her are, they're kind of all real thin in tone versus say the sky, which is very dense in tone. And that's generally what I'd prefer in my negative is I'd rather have a dense neg than a thin neg. What happens then is the shot looks washed out because the printer has to expose with less light and that results in washed out appearance. Now in this final shot, I metered the highlight on her at 250th at f8 again, but to get some more density out of the shadows, since most of her is in shadow, I opened up to f4, two full stops. This ensured a denser negative, more information in the shadows. Now while this also made the shot a little bit more red, I can easily add again some cyan back to correct it. Now when it comes to transparency film, that's a different animal, also known as slide film, also known as chromes, um, also known as positive film. That's kind of a different thing, and you really don't want to exp overexpose that film or underexpose it. You really want your exposures as accurate as you can get with slide film. Maybe I would overexpose it by a half stop, but even then you really have to kind of take into context the bright areas of the photo, how the total percentage of bright area in that shot, and if overexposing the sh that chrome at it at all is going to have a negative effect on most of your image. Now, if it's a specular highlight at some point in the image, uh, that's something worth let, letting go to total blown out, depending upon what it is and, and how much of the total image it encompasses. But really with transparency film, you'd be looking to expose for the highlight and fill in your shadows. Slide film is also a little harder to get developed these days. So some places you can purchase like a little envelope and you pop your slide film in it and mail it off and they'll mail you back your developed chromes, but then you have to get them scanned. So between the cost of the transparency film, the cost of developing it, and the cost of scanning it, uh, you know, it's really a labor of love at that point because it starts to get kind of expensive. Now I will say that a properly exposed trans piece of transparency film on a light box under a loop is really pretty amazing to see, particularly coming from a really nice film camera. But it's really kind of an expensive endeavor compared to the kind of quality you can get out of a digital photograph these days. Like here's an example of a scan from a film called Scala, which was an ISO 200 black and white slide film. Kind of interesting stuff. Here's one of standard Tmax 400 black and white negative film that I had to process myself in a dark room. And here's a scan of Fuji Velvia film known for its real saturated colors, real saturated blues you can see in the sky here. So the last step we need to look at is after you've gone out and you've done some shooting and you've taken notes so that you can kind of learn from this experience, was to get the film back out of the camera. So on a lot of these cameras, there's a little button down on the bottom that releases the film 
and you pop up the little spindle and you begin to wind the film back into the cartridge. There will be a certain amount of tension that you would feel and you're really just gonna kind of wind through that tension until all of a sudden you'll hear kind of a popping noise. It'll sound like the film has like come undone from the other side, which is good. And then all of a sudden the spindle will get real loose. You can pop that spindle up and remove the film, and then you're ready to take that to your lab to be processed. In conclusion, film cameras are pretty cheap out there, and you can find them on eBay, Craigslist, um, you know, your local thrift shop, old camera shops. Um, you know, often the 35 millimeter SLR cameras, kind of like this one, uh, Pentax K1000, Canon AE1, those are some like popular ones. Often you're gonna have the most choices as far as lenses that you could get um, and the different bodies. If you can find yourself an inexpensive incident meter, even better. Um, however, one downfall of this kind of meter is if your scene is really far away across a long valley and you're shooting a landscape um, and you're using a longer lens, it's gonna be hard for you to get, if you're standing in the shade but your scene is in some other type of lighting, for you to get this dome out there. In which case, a reflective meter is what you're gonna want to try to use in that situation. And you can even get reflective spot meters that have a little bit of a telescopic view to them where you can zoom in on areas of your scene at a distance. And if that's the case, if you can find one of those and you'd like to use one of those, you probably want to become familiar with the zone system and learning how to expose based upon that. So there you go. You got Sunny F16 to kind of get you going as far as a base exposure based upon the ISO film you're putting in your camera. You can load your film. We know how to load it now. We know how to get that film back out, how to generally expose for the film, what we're seeing with that meter when something's over or underexposed, the difference between a reflective meter and an incident meter, and we looked at the results of some of these shots. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, you know what to do. You can leave some comments down below if you'd like. Feel free to subscribe up there and down there. You can hit that little bell to be notified. Thanks to Canna for providing some of the equipment to make these videos possible. Thanks for watching.